Hello and welcome to the first panel of the uh, Dayton 25 conference organized by the European Council on Foreign Relations. My name is Vesela Cherneva, I'm the Deputy Director of ECFR and I'm very happy to be the host of this first panel. I will have actually uh, quite a star uh, group um, with me this afternoon. Uh, we will hear from Carl Bildt, uh, former Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Sweden, Sabine Čudić, a Member of Parliament of uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Wolfgang Ischinger, um, Chairman of the Munich Security Conference, and uh, Jim O'Brien, uh, the Vice President of the Albright Stonebridge Group. Um, all of the um, colleagues and friends uh, I have just mentioned have been uh, very vividly involved and very directly involved in what uh, has happened 25 years ago. Uh, they have all witnessed the disagreements uh, among the international community while at the same time um, genocide was uh, happening on the ground. There was lack of understanding of what was going on uh, on the ground, uh, what were the interests uh, and the ambitions of the different actors, how to deal with the state capture. But overall, the West seemed helpless for quite some time. How was that possible given everything that television was showing to us back then? Carl. I think you're entirely correct in saying that the West was uh, helpless in the beginning of this particular conflict because we had been living in a world where we were dealing with nuclear weapons and tank divisions and full bag apps and whatever. That was security. These sorts of conflicts was uh, unknown by uh, the Western security elite. Cyprus might have been an exception, but that was an exception. I think Henry Kissinger has a vivid description of this particular phenomena in his memoirs where he said this was completely new. We were not aware of these sorts of conflicts. And, and then the dissolution of Yugoslavia, well, it has been talked about, but uh, uh, no one had been focusing on it. The Americans were preoccupied with other issues. Jim Baker said famously, we don't have a dog in this particular fight. They were preoccupied with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the fate of the nuclear weapons. Uh, the Germans, obviously, very much with the uh, reunification of Germany, the European Union didn't exist at all. Um, we didn't have any instruments, whatever, of the common, you know, even ambitions of a foreign common and, and, and security policy. So it, it, it caught the West at an opportunity where we're completely unaware of these sorts of issues and where the West was preoccupied with other issues of monumental significance, has to be said. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the reunification of uh, Germany and, and Europe and uh, the Gulf War, to take another one uh, of, of the thing that happened at roughly the same time. So it was then, uh, I, I, I sometimes divide it into a couple of phases. If you look, um, it has to be said that I was not around, I was Prime Minister of Sweden at the time, so my exposure to it, which was fairly significant, was uh, receiving refugees. I think Sweden took more refugees from Bosnia than any other country in relationship to its size. Uh, and in addition to that, we sent fairly substantial military forces there. But I was not involved in the in the politics of it. But if you look at it, um, the first phase was uh, trying to save Yugoslavia light. That failed for a number of reasons. Uh, the second was an attempt to do something with Bosnia. The Lisbon talks in March 1992, the Cotelier proposal. Could that have worked? I don't know. Uh, but it is was striking that if you look at the Dayton, uh, agreement. Uh, the essence of Dayton and the essence of Cotillero before the outbreak of the war is not too dissimilar. Um, uh, so that reflects. Then the phase that came after that was of course the uh, Lon London Conference, um, uh, which led up to the uh, uh, Vans OM peace plan. And I think, I just have to give a little bit bloody telephone, someone who's trying to call me. Sorry. Um, which I think in retrospect is the biggest failure. Um, no question that the war should have been closed down in early 1993. Uh, that would have been perfectly possible at that particular time. There was a, a unity, but then unity broke apart. And we entered a long period when there was really not very much serious uh, work in terms of peace. That was the Federation Agreement in February 1994. 
in order to close down the, the, the Muslim Croat war, which is good in a sense, and pave the way for a building block at Dayton. But then it was really the fourth phase, which I call it, which came in the summer of 1995, when it became apparent that uh, it was necessary for the international community to get its act together. And the international community was everyone. I mean, Russia was part of it. That should not have not been not be forgotten. And to take all of the previous peace plans, really, on the spot. Dayton is a combination of sort of, it was a federation, it was a 4959 uh, that had been agreed earlier. It was the entities that had came out of earlier plans. And that was primarily on the American side, a realization that things needs to be done once at one point in time. And that concentration of political resources uh, in combination with the fact that at that time, everyone uh, was tired of the war. There was a, there was a distinct war fatigue. Um, but, uh, and that contributed to the possibility of Dayton. But in retrospect, I think the, big, the two big failures are uh, the failure to prevent the war in Bosnia in uh, February, March, April uh, 1992, uh, question mark. Could it have succeeded? Could the Lear plan? And then the big failure was the failure to agree on the Van Zoen peace plan, because no question the war should have ended in February of uh, 1993. Why do you think that happened? Why did the Van Zoen plan? Uh, why, why didn't it well, materialize? I mean, Jim, Jim can speak to that. Uh, the, the, uh, it was a change of administration in the U.S. And the U.S. had, as said, taken somewhat of an offhand approach. Um, it, had de it had delegated the entire thing to, uh, to uh, David Owen and Cy Vance, and they had produced this particular plan. The Clinton administration came in, and I mean, Clinton has talked about that and said he, he, was, he, he was afraid that it was going to be too much of ethnic separation with the Vance Owen police plan, which, would be, which is less than Dayton, by the way. Uh, but uh, he didn't know it at the time. And that meant that sort of the entire, the entire international consensus collapsed and was not really resurrected until uh, uh, August, September, we'll say September of 1995. I mean, that long period was a long period of, uh, in my opinion, unnecessary honor. I, I say this with, uh, with hindsight. I wasn't around in that capacity. I came in as an EU negotiator only in May of 1995, after David Owen. Um, thanks a lot. I will turn to Ambassador Ischinger uh, and want to really congratulate him for being also brave to come physically to our conference venue. Uh, we're very happy to see you there. Uh, it looks great, much better than any of us here. Um, <laughs> just uh, one, uh, uh, maybe go to, to those three years, 92 to 95, um, international community building up to some sort, building up some sort of a consensus, but also European foreign policy kind of slowly emerging. Uh, of course, it was by far not there yet. How did it look like uh, from, from Bonn perspective at that time? Well, first of all, I think uh, Carl has uh, already made a, a key point uh, by pointing out that, of course, Germany in the early 90s was primarily uh, preoccupied with uh, the process of uh, reunification with domestic issues and also uh, with, an, uh, with a significant reluctance to engage in anything that, <clears throat> that had any military connotations. Remember that the f 2 plus 4 treaty on German uh, unification needed to be ratified not only by the United Kingdom and the United States, but also by the Soviet Union, which still existed in the very early uh, 90s. And our uh, principal interest in uh, uh, 91 uh, even going into 92 was, let's make sure that no one in Moscow will come up with last-minute hesitations about ratifying this. So let's 
play really low key. And uh, I can add that uh, Chancellor Helmut Kohl at the time, when the question of uh, military engagement uh, was raised, uh, had very strong personal views about uh, this. He said, uh, if you remember the atrocities committed by the German Wehrmacht, by the German, by the Nazi uh, army uh, in the 1940s uh, throughout the Balkans, if we uh, sent German soldiers into this region, people will remember the atrocities and we would be part of the problem, not part of the solution. So there was a lot of hesitation, but there was another problem. If you think about an emerging consensus, and I think that's the word you just used, uh, I served at the time in the early 90s as a, as a, as a diplomat in Paris. And uh, what happened during the initial years of the Balkan Wars was that people in Germany saw a very different conflict from the one that people in France were given to see. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the fact that when you were watching television or listening to radio commentators or, or reading the newspapers in France, you were exposed to the narrative, here is the Yugoslav state defending its integrity against you know, this irredentist movement in Slovenia, in Croatia, and then finally also in Bosnia-Herzegovina. If you listened to the German side of this, uh, you got a very different narrative in these early years of the conflict. The narrative in Germany was, oh, our poor neighbors in Croatia and Slovenia, they're being attacked uh, in a brutal manner by the Yugoslav army who uh, is trying to uh, destroy Vukovar and, and, and other cities, uh, you know, on, uh, in Croatia. So how do you build a consensus uh, out of these totally uh, different uh, narratives initially? It was hard work. And I think the, the secret of why and how we finally ended up with a common position was the fact that at some point the Clinton administration actually did step in and say, uh, uh, we're going to lead this effort and we will um, be uh, willing to uh, establish ourselves once again as a European power, as a power in Europe, and we will lead the diplomatic effort and we would also be prepared to engage to the extent necessary in um, uh, in, 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 a, in a military presence. So I think the consensus building effort was uh, accelerated and was essentially made possible by the leadership that at that point in time the United States demonstrated to her European allies. Without the US, of course, Dayton would never have happened. Thank you very much. I uh, while you were in Paris, I was a student in Bonn, and I remember um, in those uh, years, the German media was really full of um, information about the Bosnian War. There were these maps uh, uh, where people could follow really what was happening. And, uh, and I wonder, is there a, spe a special interest? Uh, you mentioned the difference to France. Uh, but I think that was also visible um, in 92, 93, the recognitions, Germany was driving those recognitions of the uh, various independent uh, states that came out of Yugoslavia. Maybe if you can say that in, in a couple of sentences, why, why this happened that way? Well, first because of I think all, the German role is very was very important back then. Uh, yes, it was. But uh, the essential point here is helplessness. We knew at the time, our government uh, was aware that we were not going to be able to play any role in 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 the military sense. So the idea which turned out to be not an entirely successful idea. The idea was, so what if we recognize Croatia and Slovenia as independent sovereign countries? At that point, the Yugoslav army, the Serbs, 
would not dare, would they? They would not dare attack a sovereign country. That was sort of this, this legalistic uh, German approach at the time, uh, it well intended, uh, but of course not, uh, not really uh, successful. Our problem at the time was that we were, as I tried to say earlier, that we were really tied down by the after effects of unification. We were not capable at the time of thinking about deploying, as François Mitterrand suggested to Chancellor Kohl at the time, can we uh, take some military action together? It took the United States to, to step in. And finally, let me, let me add this. Uh, historically, of course, uh, for the French, especially for those who, who understand uh, the history of the first half of the 20th century, the F French remembered their wartime um, you know, friendship and alliance with Serbia. And uh, there are monuments uh, in the Bois de Bologna in Paris uh, uh, honoring, uh, you know, the, the Serb leadership. And um, Germans traditionally have had, over the centuries really, if you go back in history, have had uh, uh, relatively close ties with places and cities and, 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 uh, and areas that are today part of Croatia. So there were far more uh, German journalists reporting from Zagreb than from Belgrade at the time. And, uh, uh, and the French were, of course, only reporting from Belgrade and not from Zagreb. So we, we had really serious problems in, uh, in getting our act together at the time, regrettably. And here enter um, Bill Clinton, um, new administration, um, somebody who um, was a, a new face to Washington and to Europe. And then he had this whole uh, drama on his hands and this frustration and helplessness that uh, uh, Ambassador Ischinger just described. Jim, how, how did that uh, gradually change. I think this is very interesting now uh, because there are many uh, attempts to make historic parallels. I'm not, we're not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we do have to try to learn something. I think Carl and Wolfgang have described well the broader political framework. Um, I, I, I was a young lawyer at the time actually to the end of the Bush administration. And I was responsible, among other things, for uh, talking about violations of the laws of war. So I spent two years collecting all the information available to the US government about the atrocities being committed in Bosnia, who was doing it, what was the story on the ground. And I'll, I'll say I agree completely with what Wolfgang and, and Carl have said, but I think fundamentally, the reason we didn't intervene is that we failed. We looked away. I found myself constantly trying to educate members of both our political parties about what was happening on the ground, about a systematic campaign of um, genocide. And people were busy with other matters. So in one sense, what's a lesson we, we take from that? The, the first, a first lesson, I think, is that we had to build structures so that it was hard for us to look away. And if you look at the history of the international engagement with Bosnia, much of it is informed by the need to keep our attention focused. That's partly what the International Tribunal is about. It's a record of the atrocities that happened. The changes in NATO, at the time, this was regarded as out of area, not a subject for NATO's engagement. That's fundamentally different. By 10 years after this war, NATO was engaged really around the world with many more partners globally than allies within the, the alliance. That's an effect of what, what happened in Bosnia. The establishment of the office of the high rep that Carl led at, at the beginning was an effort to make sure that there was a senior political figure who could talk to leaders around Europe and the United States about what was happening on the ground in Bosnia. We've lost that with OHR in recent years, but that was its initial function. And I'd add a whole range 
of really powerful non-governmental organizations, such as you and our hosts here today, really are built around the need to keep the international community focused. And what Wolfgang's done with the Munich Security Conference, right, which is one of the main places that international figures come together to talk about issues in the Balkans. All of this is an effect of what happened at the beginning of the 90s when we got consumed with other issues and didn't pay attention to the human cost of what was happening in Bosnia. Now, what are some other lessons we, we take from the time? I think part of the, the, the difficulty is getting us agreed facts. I think Wolfgang gave a great description of the problem at the beginning. Another one was that each partial step the West took inhibited a more complete solution of the problem. So there were a series of early partial agreements. The recognitions committed each of the Western partners to become kind of champions of one warring faction or another. The peacekeeping operation itself was installed in an effort to lower the level of humanitarian violence, but it, in fact, it made it more difficult to engage against the primary perpetrators of violence later on. And, and then we developed a set of assumptions that fed into the peace agreements. And Carl's exactly right. The, the Dayton wasn't born um, ab initio out in Ohio, right? It, it drew heavily upon a set of previous agreements. And we can talk about where, where we think that locked us into where we are today. So, so each of those partial steps led us into a, a situation where it was more difficult to resolve the underlying conflict than less. Why did it finally happen well? Well, of course, it happened because we couldn't look away anymore. We were faced in the summer of 95 with a horrific act of genocide, right? Uh, maybe it was a, a death throw of a Bosnian Serb dream that, that never deserved to live. But the, the, the idea that they could once and for all settle all territorial questions through an act of horrific violence made it impossible for the West to look away. You add to that geopolitically, the situation was different. President Chirac famously said that the position of leader of the Western world now is vacant. And that certainly got attention in Washington, leading to a decision that we had to be involved um, to, to go forward. The, the final piece, and there are a lot of lessons to take from this. So, so we have to operate together. We have to look at what the real problems are um, and, and try to address them in a more comprehensive way rather than piece by piece. But the final bit I'll say is in any, as we start to talk about the problems of today, we have to approach it all with humility and with a recognition that, you know, we only see what we do at the time when we act. We know that's not going to be the final um, resolution of all the problems. So you have to keep at it over time and listen to the people most affected. Um, I think when we don't do that, we're more likely to fail. Thanks a lot. We'll come back, I think, to uh, uh, to the future, or to the to how to use those lessons in the future, um, and um, maybe we can start that already a little bit with Sabina, um, reflecting on uh, the the kind of '90s uh, developments and disagreements of the international community. The fact that it took uh, the U.S. to intervene in order for Europe to get its act together, uh, but also reflecting on the uh, um, uh, on the disagreements and the differences within uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina itself, right? Uh, um, how, I mean, is there a lesson that comes, that, that stands out for you, uh, for, for the society from the 90s, looking at it from your perspective today? Well, hello. Um, I've been listening to the panelists so far and thinking about my strategy, which can go in two directions. One direction is to be the resident disagreeer and tell you as coming from a person who was 10 years old when the war started. I was actually just celebrating my 10th birthday in April 92 in Bosnia and Herzegovina in Sarajevo. Um, I can say that the policies of your countries that you represented at the time failed miserably. Coming from a person who lived and spent her um, part of her formative years in Sarajevo from 92 to 96, um, but also continues to live the aftermath of these decisions made. Um, but that's only one path where we would 
play the blame game and kind of uh, revisit history in a way that my professor, when I was a younger student at Cambridge University, asked us, was the Second World War inevitable? And it's a philosophical question. Was the war in Balkans inevitable or could we stop it or prevent it or stop it sooner? Uh, with the actors that we had at the time, as I think the panelists agree so far, it wasn't. Should it have been? Must it have been? Of course, absolutely, no doubt. Um, but looking, I take the strategy number two to kind of lessons that, that we can agree on here at the panel and direct them towards the future, um, because um, I still hope that a larger portion of my life is in the future and not in the past. And I choose to take the path of optimism and constructive approach to building the future of my country. So I'm going to point out the two things that were said um, by the speakers so far, but also in some of the statements that they made sometimes before, which I think could be useful in, in paving the way for the future. Um, and, and the last intervention uh, uh, made by Mr. Bryant, he said something that, that resonated, and of course he was talking about Dayton and peace negotiations, but I think still hold true and are an important lesson for the future. He said each partial step taken um, created more difficulties in the long run each partial solution. So when the solution is not finished, when you're seeking short-term benefit over long-term vision in the nego peace negotiation process, we end up with imperfect solutions. Uh, although all solutions, political solutions are to some degree imperfect, but some are more imperfect than the others. Um, and I would reflect on Mr. something that, um, that Mr. Ischinger was writing, Ambassador Ischinger was writing about um, some years ago, I believe it was in 2005, where he was reflecting on the lessons he learned and that he would suggest to future participants of peace negotiations, lessons learned specifically from Dayton, where he says that compromising on issues of principle, essentially, uh, for the sake of rapid negotiations, turns out to be always um, uh, a bad idea. Um, and, and in that sense, uh, what I can say uh, as somebody who suffered as a result of these policies, whose family suffered, um, I think it's time for the harder way, for the long-term approach, for the projects that are not necessarily good on three-month reports, for the embassies not to have only pretty pictures from Bosnia for the, for the little project that they're engaging in, but to have a brave strategy for the next 25 years. And this, I will quote Ms. Helic, Baroness Helic for, from her introduction. So she said, she said, these suggestions are not plea for help or plea for assistance, uh, but they are plea for recognizing joint interests that both sides have and the responsibility that both sides have. Me as a politician in Bosnia and Herzegovina and member of the federal parliament, but also to partner with the international community in a more meaningful way and to avoid, I would say, which is the biggest, biggest mistake of Dayton Agreement and the processes that you led, is a lesson not learned from the Second World War. And that is that the policy of appeasement does not work. And that the policy of appeasement of extreme nationalist forces in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the past 25 years has failed. Um, so if we can move on, if we can accept these things that the previous speakers have said um, and accept that some of these um, short term benefits and the policy of appeasement with the extreme nationalists did not work in, the, these, in these past 25 years, can we move the discussion towards what will work? And I will have suggestions for that, uh, hopefully in the second part of the discussion. Thank you. Ambassador Ischinger, there is also one comment in the chat by Christian Schmidt. He says that already in 92, there were young politicians uh, uh, who would accept the right of self-determination of Croatians and Slovenians uh, like it was granted to the Germans already in 1990. Um, is, it, is it about old elite, new elite? Do you think there is a new understanding in younger politicians or um, would you say there is a the divide lies somewhere else i'm not sure it's a, a old versus young uh, debate um, i think that uh, it has taken us most of these last 25 years to figure out that the way forward is uh, by creating a system where we will be capable of uniting early and of developing a 
common views of developing a common strategy. I'm speaking about the European Union. Uh, but actually, quite frankly, we're still not there. Uh, on foreign policy in the European Union, I would say one of the lessons that we should have learned from the tragedies of the Balkan Wars uh, was that we should, of course, uh, not allow each and every single member state of the European Union on each and every single issue that comes before the Council to, to cast a veto, which means that on, on too many issues, the European Union doesn't have a view. It cannot get its act together. So one of the lessons learned is let's get rid of the veto. Uh, that's hard. It is very difficult for many of our member states to even imagine that they would, uh, as they call it, lose some of their foreign policy sovereignty. But that's the only way forward. If we want to make sure that in the future the European Union can be a more respectable, a more capable, um, a more meaningful actor for peace, not for aggression, uh, for peace and for peacemaking, that's one of the lessons uh, hopefully we will continue uh, uh, we will not forget and continue to work on it, but we're still not there, even after 25 years. Sitting in Sofia, I can confirm that small countries uh, tend to perceive their sovereignty as a right of veto, uh, unfortunately. Um, maybe over to Carol, uh, if we can come back a bit uh, uh, to, to Bosnia and to the internal situation because there is still uh, you know th the threat is still there that uh, the country may disintegrate that the Republika Srpska may decide to succeed how I mean looking at it uh, from the experience of the last 25 years how uh, risky or how how big a chance you think there is for that well, before commenting upon that, just briefly look back at the, the early 90s, because I think it's important to have the, the context as it was at the time. Uh, we discuss interventions, but interventions are difficult. Um, Mogadishu 1993 had a profound effect on the willingness, primarily, but not only by the Americans, to use ground power anywhere, because it was, you remember, it was a horrible humanitarian tragedy. They tried to go in and sort out some of the political problems with military force, it ended in utter disaster. Uh, that led also to the Rwandan genocide, uh, one year later, I think, one year later, yeah, absolutely. An extreme reluctance to do anything because it was too complicated. So we tend to say there was a famous, uh, not very politically wise and diplomatically wise statement by Butrus Ghali at the time, if you remember when he went to, uh, when he went to Sarajevo. Um, and he said, well, you have your problems here. And then he gave a long list of problems in the world that were at least as bad. And, and it was true. It was a very complicated time with lots of challenges all over the time. So it wasn't only, it wasn't only that. Um, as is now um, to switch Vesla, um, I don't belong to those that see any threat to the territorial integrity of uh, Bosnia. I think the, 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 there was an extremely unfortunate episode a couple of years ago when some in some other parts of the region started to play around with changing borders, which I think is absolutely disastrous in terms of its potential impacts. Um, but you see, you can have someone in, uh, say, Republika Srpska declaring independence. Okay, good luck to them. Who cares? Um, the only thing that could make that dangerous is if, the, if Belgrade would recognize them. Um, uh, Croatia is not going to do it. Uh, but I think as long as we got the region locked in is the wrong word perhaps, but it's somewhat relevant, in the process of European integration, and everyone has signed on to these particular principles, I, 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 I think that risk is extremely limited. Um, I understand Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, is in uh, in um, uh, in Sarajevo today. And uh, if you listen to what the Russians have been saying, they have been very clear on this particular point as well. Which means that if there's not support for that anywhere, it's not going to have any effect. And and let me just say that one of the really success stories of Dayton um, 
is the freedom of movement. I vividly remember the period immediately after the war when uh, we feared that it was going to be a hard border. We really fought against a hard border in Bosnia. Um, uh, and now we have a situation where you move freely around Bosnia and if, if you are not, if you don't know where the inter entity boundary line is, uh, you hardly notice it. Um, so there's, there, there's an ease of communication among ordinary people that I think is, uh, um, has a dreamlike quality to it, if you know the situation that was there 25 years ago. So I, I, I think Bosnia, with all of its difficulties, uh, Bosnia as a territorial sovereignty uh, is not something that I worry about. In, in a piece that w we're about to publish, you write um, that still Sarajevo is more solidly Bosniak than ever, that Banja Luka is more solidly Serb than ever, and Mostar is as deeply divided between its Croat and Muslim parts as ever. Um, there is this trend of uh, homogenization within the, the three ethnicities, and this trend has been there for quite some time now. Uh, it cannot be productive, could it? What do you think is, is the way out of this? Well, one would hope that uh, it will gradually moderate. I mean, there has been what we call minority returns uh, have been more in Bosnia than after virtually any other conflict that we can think of in sort of modern European history. Uh, but clearly not, not perfect. Um, if I talked to, I talked about 100,000 Bosnians who ended up in Sweden. Um, I would say 70,000 of them are still here. Um, uh, but I also see them moving back with businesses and things like that. So I, I, I think over time, particularly in the urban environment, uh, you will see that. Um, I think I write in that particular piece as well. You have mosques coming back in Banja Luka and Foča. You even have the you even have the <laughs> Serb Orthodox Cathedral being built in rebuilt in uh, in uh, in Mostar. I mean, these were things that were hardly thought possible uh, some years ago. Not perfect, certainly not, but it could have been worth, much worse. Thanks, I think it's also uh, remarkable the, the, the detail with and the, the, the attention with which you follow uh, Bosnia after that many years. Um, I don't know whether you have a Bosnian citizenship, but you should get one if you don't. <laughs> Jim, um, many people are, of course, uh, hoping in Europe and especially on the Balkans that uh, the new Biden administration is going to to take all this issue on uh, and uh, help help the Balkans. What do you think is realistic uh, of those expectations? How much of the Dayton legacy is something that that the new administration would care about? Um, so I can't speak for the new administration, um, which is being very, very careful about not acting like it's in office until it is. Um, the, and I think anyone can look at the statements that, that the president-elect has made to see what, um, what his commitment is. I think it's very strong. I think, you know, look, in the U.S., we see uh, the interventions in the Balkans as a, a moment of the good use of power and certainly the most successful and peaceful intervention of the post-Cold War period, the, um, the military intervention. So, so there's a legacy to be preserved, but there's also a recognition that it's time to stop treating the region like a post-conflict area and start seeing it as a, an area that has civic um, uh, representation and engagement in European structures. So that's going to take some change. And I think one of the questions will be how can the US and the main international actors agree on an agenda that um, allows for change while preserving what's been done to this point. I mean, to before we get into the programmatic element, I think we all have, again, approached this with humility all of our societies are dealing with fundamentally the same problem, which is the rise of this identity-based politics that's manipulated by leaders who, who use these appeals to stay in power. 
and and none of us are handling it very well. If you look at the EU's dealing with rule of law internally, and um, the recent uh, discomfort on the streets of uh, my own city here, where where you have a leader whipping up a very tiny group of people to to speak in, on behalf of a, a kind of identity politics that maybe we saw in the former Yugoslavia in the 80s, right? I agree with Carl. We're not at a point of dissolution, but but we are seeing some of these themes. So how do we deal with those things? And I think here the question is, is whether we, we refocus on the current problem, which is the lack of the civic identity, or, or we try to do more of the same. Because I think if we have more of the same kind of engagement that we've had really since about 2005, I think we'll just get more of the same results. And I mean, I've got my own ideas on what that agenda might be, but I don't want to put that in the, um, and say that that's going to be the Biden administration's approach. So I think you will see engagement and a desire to work closely with the uh, with the EU and the other international actors. What exactly will come out of it, I think, is partly to be influenced by discussions like these and voices from Sarajevo. Can you unpack a bit, uh, a bit um, that um, lack of civic identity and what do you think could be done? I think this is basically the the focus of what we should be talking about. Okay, I mean, just a, a couple of notes, and and I know everybody will will come in on this, so I'll speak a little longer than I should, just so I make sure I get two cents in. The um, well, Dayton, as everyone knows, was an a, a, essentially an armistice, right? It was a time when the three dominant groups, the ones who had some military power converted military power into political authority. And, you know, so at the, at the top, you, you saw this division of, of governmental responsibilities among those three groups. Um, and I'll, I'll say, when we went into Dayton, Carl in particular, and also Wolfgang, were very strong voices for a simplified, more civic um, uh, approach, a sort of classic, simplified prime ministerial governmental structure. But that wasn't what the warring parties wanted. And, and so the piece we made is the piece that was available at the time. What we've seen is that the, there's a divide between the formal institutions of government and the actual instruments of power in Bosnia. So when we talk to them about 14 areas in which the state must improve in order to join the EU, they, they acknowledge it and there may be progress or there may not. Recently, not very much. But their actual negotiations with each other are about jobs and money from state-owned enterprises and the, the kind of instruments of power that the, the political parties can, can wield. So if we want to make progress, we have to look at those instruments of power. Now, that's comfortable for an American because we tend to think in terms of power. Europeans think in terms of rules, right? And the European Commission will say, we have the same approach for all aspirants and, and we want to proceed in the same way for all aspirant countries. And I think we have to acknowledge that in Bosnia, we, we need a strategy that, that punishes the leaders for their manipulation of political identity. And, and that, I think, turns on, I mean, there are a set of, of specific instruments we can try to use. But I think until we begin to take away their authority over the patronage networks that keep them in power, and we force there to be some competition, not within each of the three groups that emerged from, uh, from the war, but, but uh, in positions of power, but that they have to begin competing, not only maybe with each other, but perhaps regionally for money and for influence, then, then you start to change the incentives of the players in the game. And that's something we can do internationally. So just as one, to make this even more practical, so I've, over the last year, I've been very interested in this idea of a, a regional common market. And, and part of the reason for that is it creates an opportunity for these uh, six Western Balkan states to become a, an entity that can really contribute to the European uh, economy, but, but can also benefit from deeper integration. Because as it stands, only Serbia is integrating at all. But there's a political component to this as well. It's that right now, Within Bosnia, each of the three constituent peoples has control over a certain part of the economy. 
and they, the leaders of each of those groups may compete with each other to, to have dominance within, but they don't compete across. So the way to, to affect that is you sort of widen the, the region in which they have to compete. And suddenly you allow for, for much different, not only um, much different alliances across the region, but you allow for a very different group of international investors and businesses to play a role in the region. And they won't put up with the kind of backroom deals and, and penny anti-corruption that have typified the Bosnian economy for too long. So it becomes a much different environment. My main historical lesson for how this can work is the United States. The first 20 years after our independence, admittedly, you know, 200 years ago, was, was an example of local elites getting control of economically valuable properties. Once we began to emphasize that it was a nationwide economy, suddenly you found yourself with a much different political economy in the state. And I think that's the place we should put our emphasis. Thanks a lot. Uh, I also want to thank all uh, all of the participants who put in questions in the chat box. I'm trying to integrate them uh, in the conversation as we go. Uh, I would like to ask Sabina now, because we are very much looking forward uh, the plan for the next 25 years. Jim started us off. Um, he started um, in a very, if I can say, American way uh, with the with the um stick rather than the carrot the european way is always the other way around he said we have to punish leaders <laughs> no 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 you started with the stick the money came second you started we have to punish leaders for manipulation of political authority and for patronage networks and i think frankly this is something that is valid beyond bosnia if we're talking about the regional aspect of this um but maybe Sabina can talk to us about the Bosnian political aspect. Uh, after so many years of kind of foreign interference, to put it mildly, um, there have been more than 1,000 decisions by the OHR. Um, would Bosnians accept uh, really this type, of, uh, this type of punishment or intervention from the outside? Well, judging by from how our political leaders look like, they are not big on eating vegetables and carrots. So yes, to put it short, the I'm all for uh, punishments and sticks in Bosnian context. But I have to come back to something Mr. Bild said, saying about how borders will not are not under question and territorial sovereignty of Bosnia is not under question because we are locked. The region is locked in the EU process. The region and specifically Bosnia and Herzegovina are not locked in the EU process. What they are locked in is the status quo, which is literally keeping us away from the EU path. So expecting that these political elites and these political leaders will fulfill the 14 recommendations is utterly futile and lost time. Every day we spend expecting them to do so um, is a day lost. To put it uh, simply for my American friends who are watching and listening, it's like asking from a turkey to look forward to Thanksgiving. That's the standard. Uh, the people who are expected to pass the laws and legislation on the EU accession path would literally be in prison if, that, if those conditions were met. Um, but I would like to advocate building on to something what Jim said, um, which, I, which I significantly in large degree agree with, is that pressure joint pressure by the EU and the United States works. What we have seen in the past um, is lack of focused strategic joint thinking about the Balkans in the past decade, in the past two decades. Uh, what we have even more worryingly seen by specifically the EU is that they've been behaving. Um, let me give you a very, very important example. Uh, the, the, the federal government of Bosnia and Herzegovina is locked due to insistence by the Croat part on the election law changes. These election, proposed election law changes are utterly outside of any EU standards. So these changes, if implemented, we would not be able to join the EU under those circumstances. However, not once have we received from the Brussels concrete message that unless Bosnia and Herzegovina changes the constitution in line with the recommendation of the European Court of Human Rights, unless we give up this kind of model of thinking and this kind of blockages uh, created by the ethno-national elites, we will not be able to join the EU. 
Not once have we received this message. I believe that the EU has been increasingly behaving like a disoriented Santa Claus in the region, rewarding everybody that they shouldn't be and forgetting those that they should. Um, but to put it also bluntly, pressure works. Pressure and uh, it showed in the past seven days when mild to low to mild, mild to kind of medium level of pressure by the EU and the United States jointly when it comes to uh, prosecutorial's office in on the national level in Bosnia and Herzegovina resulted in two things removal of the plague uh, after Radovan Karadzic war criminal in the in the student dormitory in Pale and the resignation of the head of uh, judicial and prosecutorial council who was proven to be um, deeply corrupt. So this is an example of, can you imagine what a larger amount of pressure, joint focused pressure could create in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Not to mention that this was done in partnership with the party that I represent on the national level, we created, it was our initiative to create an investigatory body on the, in the national parliament, uh, which resulted in higher pre political pressure uh, for these kinds of resignations uh, and societal pressure for resignations in judicial, um, judicial bodies. So these are the kind of examples that we will take full responsibility for the political processes. We will create a lasting change the way we did on the cantonal level and that in two years we will be forming a government on the federal level. We need viable partners in Brussels and Washington who will send strong message to the population of Bosnia and Herzegovina, including our political opponents, that certain solutions will not be accepted that they do not meet the EU requirements, that they do not meet the requirements of the European Court of Human Rights, and that they do not meet basic standards of international law. That's simply what we need. Just to add one more uh, question to you, uh, uh, the question from Angel Petrov, how can you counteract growing foreign influence in Bosnia and Herzegovina? I think uh, it's, an, it's an aspect of what you were talking about, but maybe if you can be a bit more specific. Um, the foreign malign influence in Bosnia and Herzegovina coming from various parts of the globe is a result of diplomatic vacuum created by Washington and Brussels. So when, uh, when somebody turns, turns their head towards some other issues, there is a political vacuum here. Uh, status quo favors uh, favors that vacuum, and these political elites favor that vacuum. What's interesting about the Russian money, and particularly Chinese money, that it comes value free. EU money has conditions. Chinese money doesn't come tied with uh, with the conditions of uh, of kind of legal standards and all other standards that the EU has. But I would also like to put out there two foreign malign influences that I think in some shape uh, have been acknowledged by all the speakers today it's also the influence of zagreb and belgrade one hoping to become a member of the eu another member of the eu advocating for the le legislative changes in bosnia and herzegovina that ironically do not meet the eu standards so these kinds of lost in translation messages that are not being delivered um, are creating cementification of ethnic division in Bosnia and Herzegovina and leads me to say, if, if you're not going to help us lead the progressive forces, then please at least stop helping the nationalists. Um, Ambassador Ischinger, um, maybe you can pick this up, uh, but also there, is, there are a lot of questions to you uh, on what the EU can do, how credible is uh, Bosnia's EU future, Obviously, uh, given the situation uh, with uh, Bulgaria blocking North Macedonia, uh, but also the overall lack of uh, appetite uh, for enlargement, um, as Sabina just said, uh, many politicians pre uh, prefer the status quo rather than be in the Turkey situation. Um, so how, how much can really the EU... Um, motivate uh, in the current uh, framework? Well, allow me, before I, I, I try to respond to that, let me uh, uh, talk about, uh, you know, Brussels and Washington working together, working better together again. In fact, if you look at the last 25 years, we were actually doing a great work back in the 90s 
and uh, we have we seem to have forgotten most of this. The recent experience over the last couple of years, uh, not on Bosnia but on the, on neighboring Kosovo, was that there was a U.S. effort, totally disconnected. You can even say almost opposed to ongoing EU uh, efforts. That is not a good recipe. Uh, let me recall that when the quote unquote contact group was established uh, in whenever it was in 94 and then took uh, speed, uh, that was a major diplomatic achievement. The fact that we had major countries, the United States, uh, the Russian Federation, uh, major uh, uh, participants from, from Europe getting together, s uh, meeting practically every two weeks or so, uh, and, and agreeing, at least in principle, that they would only act, as far as Bosnia-Herzegovina was concerned, uh, after consultations within this group. Uh, that was a major diplomatic achievement. I wonder wh whether we could not reestablish at least the, the spirit of the uh, contact group experience. Uh, we had a, sec a second relatively successful example of this when, you know, in 2003, Germany, France, and the UK got together to try to tackle the Iranian problem. And then, of course, the United States joined that. And all of a sudden, we had uh, a kind of a slightly different uh, contact group, that whether you call it a three plus three or the five plus one uh, group, that finally ended up getting the JCPOA on Iran agreed. So I think one of the lessons from the Bosnian diplomatic experience of the, over the last 25 years is, you know, the contact group model is actually an enormously useful model. Let's use it whenever opportunities uh, present themselves. Now, on on, on the other question, let me say that the European Union has actually just recently uh, taken decisions that should enable the European Union morally and politically to demand of uh, candidates of countries that wish to join the European Union to meet the highest you know, uh, 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 standards of the rule of law. We have just established that within the EU, if a country violates uh, our uh, rule of law standards, uh, we will have a punishment uh, procedure in, in place. So this should actually be seen as a, as a signal, as an important signal by countries in the region, especially by leaders in Bosnia and Herzegovina, that uh, we will hold them accountable and we will demand that they respect the rule of law, in, including judicial decisions have, having been handed down by the European uh, Court, uh, etc. And finally, you know, I uh, occasionally I read articles. I read one in a in a German newspaper earlier today that, oh well, don't complain too much about what's going on in Bosnia Herzegovina. Actually, d democracy is under siege also in Belgrade and in various other places in the region. That is what, what you call whataboutism. Uh, that's not okay. Bosnia-Herzegovina is, as far as I'm concerned, a special place because we actually took responsibility uh, too late, but in, in 95 we did it. And, and Jim was, of course, one of the key architects in writing this uh, constitution. So uh, we took responsibility. We should not give up this responsibility. We should uh, uh, we should uh, uh, kickstart jointly between the, the incoming Biden administration and the European Union a process to tell the local leaders that we are going to be there. We will be involved. Uh, we're not giving up. I think the uh, office of the high representative deserves to be strengthened, not abandoned. And I would even go a step further. I know that not everybody will agree with me. You know, in 97, we finally had a breakthrough arrangement agreed, the so-called bond powers. I think that the bond powers should not be totally forgotten. Uh, this is an important um, uh, instrument which the international community has in dealing uh, with uh, issues in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Last point, uh, while I have the floor, 
uh, one item that hasn't been mentioned sufficiently so far, I think, is that, of course, what has happened in this country over the last number of years is uh, the development of, uh, I'm sorry to use this, uh, this, this negative term, a kind of kleptocracy. And we need to make, we, the international community, we, the EU, with our American friends, we need to restart a joint effort to work against corruption, against elites that benefit from the current system in a way that is bad for the country. Uh, so there is lots of work to be done, and I, I really hope that we will have a, 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 a restarted U.S.-European effort helping Bosnia-Herzegovina to move into the, up to the next level. And the door to the European Union, the door of the European Union, should, of course, remain open, should remain wide open, but only if and when the country can meet the conditionalities that were established many, many years ago in the so-called Copenhagen criteria. That's not, e that's not going to be easy for, for Bosnia to meet, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. And it should be our responsibility to, to help Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, approach and finally meet these standards and be a member of the European Union as soon as conditions permit. I'm losing the sound. Vessel, you seem Vessel to be Vessel muted. On. This is my problem. I'm sorry. I muted myself in the okay. era of Zoom. I sh this should never happen to me. Um, there is a question in the chat by uh, Jelena Nazovko, who is asking whether there is a structural issue. And I think this is also something that I would like to ask you, Ambassador Ishinger. Uh, this uh, kind of struggle between federalism and unitarism, is this an, a, the problem for, for Bosnia and Herzegovina on its way to the EU? Because I think we, we kind of remain mired in that dilemma for too, for too long now. You know, I'm, I'm not sure whether uh, uh, there is really one way f uh, forward. Uh, my own country is a, is, a, is a federal country. The United States is a, is a federal country. Um, to, what extent, uh, to what extent responsibilities should be uh, given to the central uh, government, to what extent responsibilities should be given to local or regional uh, 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 powers. Um, I'm not sure that that is the decisive thing. The question is, are these regions or cantons, uh, are they going to be able to work together um, in the interest of the collective, uh, of, of, the, of the federal country? Or are they going to work against each other, which unfortunately has been the case for, for too long on, on too many issues, uh, of course, in Bosnia. It's not unknown in my own country either. We've had, we've had instances where because of federalist, uh, federal structures, we have, we've not been able to, move, to make movement forward as, as, as quickly as, uh, as was desirable. But I think the, the fundamental idea of federalism uh, is not a bad one, uh, and it may uh, it may well be uh, more a question of the political will of of the elected of the elected uh, uh, people of the elected people and of the leaders of the country uh, to make to make the, the necessary steps forward. Thank you. Uh, Jim, you have been dealing with this also uh, within the Dayton uh, um, negotiations. What is your take on this now? I mean, you talked about identity politics. Identity politics is obviously um, kind of the political aspect of this. Uh, if, we talk, if we think about the structural side of, of, of the issue, 
do you consider it a problem? Yes, but I saw Carl, you had a finger up. I don't know if you wanted to jump in at this point and I'll come back in. No, 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 you. I'll come back to okay. Carl and then I'll return to you, Jim. But go, yeah, go on now, Jim. The, yeah, two, two things. So um, one, yes, the, the constitutional structure is a problem. As the lawyer I once was, uh, I'll claim some point of pride. There is within the Dayton Constitution an effective modern state waiting to come out, and it can come out without some kind of extraordinary new negotiation. If simply the European rules are applied to that structure, will knock off some of the carapace of the kind of Yugo nostalgia. Just as one example, the transformative potential of Sedich Finchi is not just that it allows representation for some groups that are now excluded from the presidency, but what it would do is encourage the three constituent peoples to treat the presidency like the German president. It's a totally ceremonial office in the constitution that every power given to the presidency is, is a, a, a ministerial function the presidency has power because in the in the Bosnian context, taken from Yugoslavia, presidencies have control over all the informal mechanisms of, of power within the society. And there's a set of changes that could be brought either with a new negotiation, unlikely with current power figures to, to result in anything good, or by simply applying European rules pretty aggressively. I think the second structural element is, again, a, a regional component. And here, Vessel, I want to go and play against American type and talk about money for a second. So with the European Green Deal being extended to the Balkans, there's 9 billion euro from the commission. That's more per capita than, than anywhere else in the world. And plus, there are probably about 4 to 5 billion euro every year from the major investors, including now the US government in the one good thing to emerge from the, the recent uh, diplomatic initiative. So that money can go to investing in a way that changes power structures. Bosnia's lignite factories are aged, they're sucky, the Chinese ones don't work. Any power created by coal is going to be too expensive for Bosnia to maintain. If you just replace those with a variety of renewable options, and you have the money from that flow in a transparent mechanism, you've gutted the, the political control that comes from the utility companies and the money and the jobs and other things that flow with, with that one dimension. So it's just one thing. If Bosnia wants to get more money, it can do it in a way that doesn't reinforce the current power structures, even if, if we make no change in the Dayton structure. And I think there are a series of those kinds of instruments that are available to us if we're smart over the next couple of years and we integrate Bosnia more into the European economy and bring to bear the, the actors who care about that more than the actors who care about preserving um, Dayton like it's, you know, the writings of Karl Marx or sayings of Jesus Christ. Carol, you want to talk about the structural issue here? Slightly well, I, I, oh yeah, I could do that, but I, do, I agree essentially with, with Jim and he, he reminded of the fairly bizarre situation we had in Dayton where we were arguing for a more European modern style constitution and we were up against uh, Yugoslavia. Um, but at the end of the day, it was their peace agreement, so uh, we couldn't really sort of resist that temptation to be Yugoslav too much. Which brings me to another point which I'm fond of making, but I think is fundamental. Bosnia hasn't made the transition from Yugoslavia uh, in economic terms. If, if you go to back, back to the early 90s, when uh, the socialist systems collapsed all over the countries, be that the GDR or Poland or Romania or Bulgaria did fundamental structural economic reforms. Uh, the former Yugoslavia spent that particular time during war and built war economies where they were dependent upon the old Yugoslav structures to sustain the war machineries. And that legacy is still there. Uh, the Yugoslav legacy is still there in sort of very corrupt schemes. 
Add to that, of course, that the Bosnian economy was even by sort of Yugoslav standards uh, a war economy, um, which made it very difficult to reform. And the only way of doing that, I agree with him again, uh, is to do it within the wider context. Uh, sort of be that European in integration, be that a customs union, be that a single market. I've been arguing customs union, others have been arguing single market. Um, there are other possibilities of doing in order to may have the competitive pressures being there. Um, uh, that's do not easy, but doable. But a fundamental uh, effort at economic reform is necessary. Because as has been indicated previously, I mean, the number one problem that is there in Bosnia uh, is the number one problem that is there in the region. That's the economic, social and demographic people are leaving. And, and, and it's all. I mean, Vesela, it's, it's from Sofia to Rijeka. Um, uh, the, the, the trends are not too different. Uh, and that is because of the fact that they've not been managed to get the economies going sufficiently. Uh, can we use the green transition and the digital transition to do somewhat more in that particular respect? Remains to be seen, not entirely easy. The risk is, of course, that a lot of these money goes into entrenched power structures. I mean, the, the coal power plant in Tuzla, for example, horrible, horrible, all Yugoslav, uh, but extremely popular with the people there because it's, it's always been there. And now the Chinese are coming in and say, we, we can build a new one for you. Um, and that's a typical example of uh, one of the things where we need to be very firm on the economic structures. If you don't get the economic structures right in the region as a whole, then uh, the countries, all of them, will continue to decline. And the risk with that is, of course, that over time, also political tensions will, will build up. Absolutely. I think it should go, however, in, together with the, with the political issue. The economic issue cannot be resolved uh, if, uh, the politics, if politics creates captured states, obviously. Uh, maybe one uh, last uh, question to Ambassador Ischinger, and I'll give Sabina the last word. Um, there, there is a question by Rem Zilani from Albania who asks how much you think that open problems in Bosnia and the unfinished business in Kosovo affect each other and how much they define Belgrade's behavior. If you can do this in one minute, one and a half. Well, I think my experience has been over the years that uh, as far as the Balkans is concerned, uh, everything is connected to everything else. And of course, uh, it has a, a negative impact on the rest of the region if uh, to this day there is no meaningful uh, degree of, uh, of, of uh, cooperation uh, and, and solution of the problem between Serbia. And, and Kosovo. So these problems are connected and this is why it, re it will require a comprehensive effort by us and by our American friends to, uh, to, to tackle the, the questions that we've just been discussing, but also the other questions, uh, the, the, the uh, European accession uh, problems uh, for Northern, uh, uh, Mas North Macedonia and Albania and the Serbia, Kosovo issue. Uh, it's, it should all be part of one large basket that needs to be addressed in the uh, years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sabina, how do you think uh, this whole complicated picture looks like? And maybe if you want to say something about the economic uh, versus the political aspect of things. Let me start by quickly saying that uh, we were, Nasha Stranka, my political party, was literally the only party in the federal parliament that voted against the Chinese loan for the coal power plant in Tuzla and voted against building additional coal plants. Um, but uh, there are two possible ways forward in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, nationalists in Bosnia and Herzegovina simply say that they did not create enough division. And this primarily comes from the HDZ part who are advocating for the third entity for further decentralization and regionalization of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I can see why they're asking for that. They see how well it's working for Republika Srpska. They elected genocide denier. They're completely controlling natural resources. It is probably 
the most corrupt part of Europe. Uh, in addition, of course, the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, whose current leader is being, my prime minister is being um, uh, currently charged, indicted for most serious criminal offenses and so on. So here are the people that we are expecting to implement these economic reforms. Quite simply, they will not. The other path is gradual de-ethnification of the public space in Bosnia and Herzegovina and political processes. This will not happen overnight. I don't believe in quick fixes. However, with strategic acupuncture-like intervention in the system, starting with independent judiciary, greater pressure, joint pressure by Brussels uh, and Washington in matters of fulfilling the requirements and calling out those who are not fulfilling them, quite simply will produce both short-term, medium-term and long-term results. Um, also, picking your partners, the people I mentioned, both Dodik and the heads of federal government in, in the Federation part of Bosnia and Herzegovina are collaborators and partners, close partners to the international community. So we need to stop ignoring the pink elephant in the room. Who will deliver the reforms? It will not be people who were cemented there by Dayton, and it will, the change will not be created by further ethnification. That is it. Thank you very much. This was a great another. summary of of this discussion that unfortunately we have to stop here. Uh, I think we, we will be talking more about the actors, the benign actors in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the next panels. Uh, I thank you very much for uh, doing this with us. The next panel on rule of law will start in 29 minutes. Stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to our panelists um, and to Vesela for shaping the conversation. Uh, this was a, a refreshingly frank discussion, often with diverse views, and, and that's exactly what's needed on this topic. And I feel terrible saying this to all of you as you join us virtually, but I'm really glad that I saw uh, Ambassador Ischinger here, who was brave enough to join us in person. So thank you very much for coming. Um, as Vesela mentions, our next and last session for the day will begin in 29 minutes. Uh, but in the meantime, I would like to um, reintroduce a documentary, which we've shown once today, but frankly, we can't show it enough. Um, the documentary is called Voices of Youth, 25 Years After Dayton, and it's created by students from across Bosnia and directed and organized by Ida Avdibegovic. So we thank her for that. After the documentary shows, you'll see some uh, statistics which we'll show you on screen uh, relevant to our next panel. At that time, my uh, colleague and conference organizer, Maida Ruge, will return to introduce the panel, which will begin at 4.30 p.m. Berlin time sharp. We hope to see you then. Thank you. Part of corruption and nepotism. Once I leave, I am not planning on coming back. 80,000 young people left Bosnia and Herzegovina. The unemployment rate of young people in Bosnia and Herzegovina is enormous, with almost 40% of them having no chance of finding any sort of work. Through immigration, skills and knowledge are materialized in other countries, creating a brain drain from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Students have grown tired of politicians incessantly squabbling. Professors claim we are losing the social capital. I want to change something, but I know I can't influence anything until I am someone. The destruction of the social tissue of Bosnia and Herzegovina through the departure of young people is the worst thing that could happen to us. The only way I can help my country is to become someone, but I cannot become someone here. We let our young people be second-class citizens of foreign countries. I feel like I'm listening on a CD stuck on loop here. It's all nationalism and ethnic hatred and will there be another war. It's outdated and we're fed up. Life now, not on hold. We 
have uh, done a research uh, this year, uh, Alexandra, Marco and I, and the majority of the students has said that by their opinion, it's really hard to see the, the, the future of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, we have a situation that, is, um, that isn't really good here. We have corruption, we have uh, uh, people being employed just because they are members of a political party. One third of students doesn't believe that Bosnia and Herzegovina will exist in the next 25 years. I mean, we are divided and every country in the world is divided on some perspective. That is normal, but we need to learn how to manage those uh, differences and how to live in a society that has uh, such differences within it. I don't believe that uh, th uh, this country can be united in its unity, but it can exist in uh, its uh, diversity. So we have three different narratives that collide with each other and we, it's expected from us to work together and create a future. We are the ones that actually uh, see the change that has to be made. Uh, we are the ones that can develop uh, things around here and we can do this alone. That is the main problem. We need someone to push us, to help us. We need someone uh, that is going to help our education. We, we need someone who is going to work with us. Let us respect uh, all our differences and uh, build a society in which all that will be implemented uh, and respected. I chose to study in UWC because I saw it as a chance to get to know new people and new cultures and I wanted this different experience because I already experienced what local education is. So I saw it as a chance um, of getting better education and learning new perspectives from other people around the world. In Bosnia and Herzegovina everyone has the same perspective on everything so I would like to study abroad to maybe hear some other perspectives and then build my ad identity with that, not only from this Bosnian-Herzegovinian perspectives. 
but I learned how to tackle different problems as well as uh, learn about different points of views and respect others' opinions mostly. How I see Mozart and Bosnia Herzegovina 25 years behind Dayton, after Dayton. Um, so for, I wasn't alive during the war, so I wouldn't know. I only know the stories that I've heard from my parents and from other people. So I think it's still uh, a country in progress. And I think that some people already gave up on it, but we shouldn't, especially in Mostar where we have a specific charm in our people that is really positive every day, even though we have really hard circumstances here. But I think um, if we continue being positive and hardworking in the future, we can really expand this country to be a really great um, facility to young people. So we use theater in my school to connect people and we use it to break a wall that is present in the society. Um, one positive thing and one thing that truly sets me free in the city, I would like to point out Mossa Rock School. It's a school where nationality and religion doesn't matter but the art matters. So I would like to point out that art is a great means in connecting people from all around Mostar. If I ever were to leave this country, I would love to come back because I genuinely love the people and the country itself. I can no longer allow my country to be engulfed by darkness. I need to fight for my own future and the future of our youth. I should be part of the change. If we leave, who will lead our country to a better future? Out there, it isn't as ideal as we thought it was. I must devise my own chances. We should stay here. We cannot allow ourselves to be the ones leaving just because the selfishness and carelessness of others. Maybe I shouldn't leave. <laughs>